Pleasure, pleasure. Um, I just want to make sure first that, uh, can you guys hear me clearly? You can turn it up a little bit more. Give us some more. Okay. Here and clearly. My, my background is noisy, so probably I am the problem. So I would mute my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can we try again? Can you hear me clearly? Clearly. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, thank you very much, Rod, Andrea, for that powerful introduction. That was really exciting. And now, uh, thank you, Mr. President, JCI Jamaica, the Secretary General, and every single body that made it possible for me to be sharing time with you guys today. Um, the past presenter, sorry, I just forgot the name a little bit, but I jumped in uh, in the middle of the presentation, and I think uh, you did an awesome job in terms of presenting. And um, while you were talking, I also sensed a lot of passion from you uh, towards children. And I think that is really awesome because um, I actually have a foundation as well back home in Togo. So um, I'm also very much you know, passionate by children's future. So thank you for the work that you're doing out there. Thank you. Well, you're welcome, you're welcome. All right, great. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, like I said, that uh, I am very much honored to be spending time with you all the way in Jamaica. Uh, it's not every day that it happens, right? Uh, actually, literally, I feel at home, even though we are online. Okay, so um, I mean, today I'm gonna be sharing some few things with you today, but uh, I just wanna make sure that you know we have a little bit of uh, a table rule for us to play with. And the first one is that there's a no it all, there's a no no it all rule, which means I don't know it all, and you also don't know it all. We basically learn from each other, right? And secondly, if perhaps after my talk, uh, you have a question or there are some concepts that I presented to you that you do not agree with, please feel free to reach out to me or you know ask questions. And uh, you know I'll be very much willing to learn from you and we can both develop each other. And the third should be that we must have fun, right? That is very, very much important. So if you are on with those three T and C's for this talk, please give me a yes there. Feel free to unmute your mic and give me a yes so that I know that you are in this boat. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> Great. Awesome, awesome, yes. awesome. I love it. Well. On that note, ladies, I want to share, you know, um, something very interesting with you. So, I mean, as Andrea said in my introduction, I grew up in Togo, West Africa, and uh, where, where we lived, uh, there were always there were always planes that we flew past our house. And uh, being a kid, I loved airplanes. And if you ask me when I was a kid what what I wanted to be, like many others, I will tell you that I wanted to be a pilot. And uh, Unfortunately for me, my parents, you know, which was my mom, my dad, and my sister, my first, our first boy, or my elder sister, they knew that that this young boy is a huge fan of planes. So what they would do, um, especially on days that you know they would cook a specific meal, and I would not want to eat because you know, I mean, we grew up, you know, having the minimum. So in some days, you know mom will cook the same thing and again and again. And uh, me being a kid, there will come a day where I'll be like, no, no, I don't want to eat this. So what they will do to me is we had, you know, a specific kind of clothing. Um, and it's, that one was reserved mainly for Christmas. Okay, on 25th or 31st, we wear that. And what they will do is they will ask me to dress that and we'll say, okay, we're going to catch the plane right now. Oh, and me being a kid, I get very excited. that oh yeah, we're catching the plane today. And, uh, the, the reward was to catch a plane, but what was the work that had to be put in? The work that had to be put in was that to eat the food on that day. And I would go and I'll eat the food as quick as possible, very excited. And uh, after the meal, my sister or my mom would grab my hand. We walk for 50 meters and uh, they would be like, no, sorry, the pilot is gone. <laughs> And I fell for that each and every single time, you know, I fell for that trick. But one evening, my grandfather, uh, who died, rest in peace, who died actually at the age of 121 years old. One evening, my grandfather was there and she shared a story with me that I would like to share with you. So in the 1400s, we had the African warriors called Ablafos, right? So before the Ablafos could go to war or come back to war, come back from war, my bad, uh, there's always you know, one gentleman that would take 
you know, a calabash of ash and paint steps of color for these warriors. Those warriors, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, were known to be very fearless, you know. Uh, they were known to bring home every kind of war. They actually never carry weapon, right? Whether it's by land or by air, they always brought victory home. So these gentlemen that would perform these rituals for these uh, warriors before they could go to war, and the ritual was very simple. It's a calabash of ash, you know, or color. He would paint steps all the way till the, the war, these warriors leave the village. And when they are back also, he will do the same. So ladies and gentlemen, what I wanna do today is to be that gentleman that performed that ritual for those warriors. But this group of people that you are online today, what I wanna do today, my time that I wanna spend with you today, I want to be that gentleman that whatever we're gonna to share today, whatever I'm about to share with you today, let it represent you know, those steps of colors, right? Those steps of color that I'm gonna paint one by one for you so that when you get back to your home today, or at least you are in your home, that, you know, at least when you get back to your normal lives, you know, you are able to get back to them with an oof of inspiration, with an oof of motivation and drive and a new perspective. So that is going to be the role that I'm going to play for you today. Are you in with me, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Definitely. All right. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. So the title of my talk today, uh, lovely people, is The Renaissance Leader. And before we even dive into understanding, you know, what the Renaissance Leader is and why do we need to actually be, why do we need to elevate ourselves from just you know, great leaders to becoming Renaissance leaders, of which I believe is what we actually need nowadays. You know, looking at all the various challenges that we're facing in the world nowadays, before we even get to dive into that, I would first like to take a look at the term of leadership. Till today, ladies and gentlemen, I have met a lot of impactful leaders over the world. Um, I have worked with, you know, some world taught leaders. I have co-founded the Leadership University. I have studied the concept of, le of leadership, you know, in a very, very close manner. And I cannot even start to count the many books that I've read on this subject. And when I've researched, I found that the term leadership actually got into the English language in the 1800s. But back then, the term leadership was only referred to the families like the Rockefellers. So in other words, if you actually had no money, no industry, no factory in your name, you were not a leader. But as the years went by, the term leadership then, you know, got reduced and eventually sociologists tried very hard to define this term and it got integrated into the English language, therefore into people's life accordingly. But here's the thing, when I try to, you know, get an understanding of this definition of the term leadership, there are no better definition that I've come up with and actually this is inspired by Dr. Miles Monroe. And this definition goes that leadership is the capacity to influence the thoughts, the emotion and actions of oneself and others through inspiration, motivated by passion, generated by a conviction and ignited by a purpose, right? I always advise that in my talk, you have a little pen and a paper, you know, because we know what they say that words fly by, but what you write stays. So I'm gonna repeat this definition one more time. It says that leadership is the capacity to influence the emotion, thoughts and actions of oneself and others through inspiration, motivated by passion, generated by a conviction and ignited by a purpose. Now notice that in my definition, uh, I did not only point at others, it first starts with oneself, right? So when we talk about, you know, mastering the art of influencing one's emotions, one's thoughts, one actions, in my book titled Psychology and Habits of Great Leaders, which is on Amazon currently, uh, one of the first habits that I wrote down that every single leader needs to cultivate is self-evaluation. Because you see, the truth is that there are many business people out there that apply the SWOT analysis, the SWOT principles, strength, weakness, opportunities, and threat to their businesses all the time. But how many people actually, how many CEOs actually, how many leaders actually take the time, sit down, grab coffee and say, okay, today I'm gonna apply the SWOT analysis strategy to myself, to my life. 
where they get to write down what is my strength, what is my what what, what are my weaknesses, what are my opportunities, and what are the traits right that are facing my personal life. So I then say that for us to be able to master right the art of influencing ourselves, I believe that the first thing that we need to dive into is to be able to self-evaluate, right? So get into a habit of evaluating ourselves, but bear in mind that when we dive into this habit of self-evaluation, it must be done with the most honesty possible, right? And it must be done also in a very strict manner where we do not excuse ourselves for the mistakes that we do. Now, when we dive into that habit, ladies and gentlemen, is that as a leader, we get to cultivate a character. We get to cultivate right, a certain set of habits that forge our character. I love this, you know, this sequence of Vincent Lombardi, right? If anybody knows Vincent Lombardi, he says that our beliefs becomes our thoughts. Our thoughts becomes our words, our words becomes our actions, our actions becomes our habits, and our habits becomes our character. Let me repeat that again. This is lovely. He says that our thoughts, sorry, our beliefs becomes our thoughts. Our thoughts becomes our words. Our words becomes our actions. Our actions becomes our habit and our habit becomes our character. And I'm sure ladies and gentlemen, you'll agree with me that as a leader, there is nothing more important than the character that you have, the character that your people know you by, the character that you display in front of people, the character that you show up with in the face of adversities. And in order for us to shape our character, in order for us to have the character which is well needed in this very time, it is important that what we start from a point where we are able to shape our beliefs. And our belief system is nothing more but the product of our circumstances. It's nothing more but the perception that we forge of ourselves. And the truth is, is that usually in many times, at least from my experience, having coached thousands of people, having written two books already, having spoken you know, at various conferences worldwide, I can tell you one thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that the perception of ourselves in most of the time is always less than what we could actually accomplish. You see, potential is defined as what? Potential is defined as what you could accomplish but have not yet accomplished. And usually I found that, that most of us, we actually live I mean, below the threshold, below what, the cap what truly our capabilities are, what truly our perceptions are, right? I love Dr. Miles Bond when he says that everybody is born to be a leader, but not leader of people necessarily, but leader of a particular area of our life, right? He even goes on and says that everybody's born as a leader, everybody's born to lead a particular area of their lives, but that area is nothing more but our gift, right? But here's the thing. When we have the gift, when we expose, when we expose and start to exhibit that gift, we exhibit that gift to fulfill a purpose. So when we fulfill that purpose, that purpose is not only for us, but is belongs. I mean, that purpose is served for the group that we belong to. That purpose is served, right, to rise up our families. That purpose is served to rise up our organization. That purpose is served so that we have a better life. So the question then is, what is the role that you are taking on right now? What is the character that you have in the current organization that you are in? I was talking at JCI Indonesia a few days ago, uh, I mean, a few weeks ago. And one thing I told them is this, is that it shouldn't be always about what JCI can do for you, but what you can do for JCI. And that speaks to your character. Now, if you remember, when we go back to the definition of, definition of leadership, what we are saying that is the capacity to influence the thought and emotions and actions of yourself and others through inspiration, motivated by passion, generated by a conviction, and ignited by purpose. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very much aware that JCI is all about leadership, right? JCI, it has a vision of what creating and shaping leaders for the future. But the truth is, what is a leader if he's unable to actually inspire people? 
What is the leader if he's unable to inspire people through his actions, through the life that he leads, right? Basically, what I'm saying is that what is a leader if he's unable to effortlessly influence the people around him, right? So we say that the driving force of influence is inspiration. Inspiration is defined as what the mental stimulus through which a person is able to think creatively, is through which a person is able to think way beyond and above what he's usually used to, right? So as a leader, it is important that a leader masters the art of inspiring his people and himself. And how does the leader, I mean, how is the leader, you know, able to influence the people. I think for a leader to even start by influencing people, it is important that, again, this leader is very much in tune with his purpose. You see, the purpose is the intent of the creation of a thing, right? Now, if you are in an organization, you are fulfilling a purpose. So does the leader that we are, right? Does the leader that you are, does the leader that I am or you are, are we indeed in tune with our purpose? Now, when I'm saying the purpose, I'm not only talking about the role that you're gonna play, no, I mean, on this earth, no, I'm talking about the purpose that you are to fulfill within your organization, right? What kind of life are you living? What kind of steps are you taking? What kind of actions, goals are you setting that indeed the purpose that you have in that organization, in that group that you belong to, within that family is indeed coming to life, right? We have the purpose, purpose, visions, visions, goals, goals, and what? Plans, and then we plan, we are able to take some actions, and through those actions, we fulfill that purpose. So in other words, this echelon that I've just given to you is not only applied in the life of the individual, but it's also, it's also applied in the life of the group, right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. I want to share a story with you. You see, like I said before that I was born in Togo, uh, and today I am traveling the world, and I'm, and I'm able, you know, thanks to God, be able to do the things that I'm doing today. But the truth is that it has not always been like this, right? <laughs> it has not always been like this at all. You see, at the age of 18, you know, like many, many young Jamaicans do and, you know, move to America in the quest of a better life. At the age of 18, ladies and gentlemen, right after my degree, because I finished high school at the age of 15, I actually accelerated high school. And it is no secret for, to, you know, to most probably everybody that is on this call today that Togo is a developing country, you know? I mean, if you don't know Togo, I, I'll give you a background, a short summary quickly. So Togo is actually a very small country with a population currently of 7 million people, right? And east to the west is about 180 kilometers and north to the south is 600 kilometers. So in other words, I mean, Togo is actually a country that, uh, you know, with the right infrastructure, you can actually go through that country just like this, right? So that's where I grew up. And um, the basic salary of Togo, guys, I mean, right now is about $400 per year, right? So which means that, I mean, people are living below $1, below $2, right, in Togo, even currently, right? But that's where I grew up. So I grew up in a polygamous family. So my father has two wives, he still has, right? I cannot say had, he still has two wives. <laughs> Right, and um, we we have to the amount of nine children. So I know what it is to sleep in a one bedroom with five brothers. I know what it is, you know, to speed up quickly and eat because if you don't eat as fast as possible, your elder brothers that have huge palms than you will actually finish the food. And guess what? That day you only have one meal for the day. Right. So having grown up there, you know, I just had this condition in me that at least I could be something better than what my circumstances offered me, right? And at the age of 18, I then I decided to actually relocate. You know, I looked around, I tried to get, you know, visas from Europe, from Europe, from America. I didn't really work out. So then I decided to relocate from Togo to South Africa. But here's the thing, my budget then was not much. And I remember leaving home with less than $150 in my pocket. With just a backpack, few jeans, few shirts, and I was gone, determined and driven more than ever to change my circumstances, to be the leader that I was born to be. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I will tell you the truth. I'll be very open and very vulnerable to you that it was one of the worst choices that I've ever made. This journey was tough, ladies and gentlemen, although today I can pride myself and say that, you know, a part of that journey has made me who I am today, the wisdom that I gained, the tenacity that I gained. Today, I coach people how to free themselves of fear, self-doubt, and low self-esteem. That journey totally has forced me to be who I am today. This came on that journey, ladies and gentlemen, that I had no food to eat. This came where I had no shelter. And going through Congo, if anybody knows Congo, you know that, you know, that was the verge of death that I was at. I didn't have, even after having arrived in South Africa, I slept in a shack of $20 that I couldn't even be able to pay the rent. But God be God, that day came when I was still at the side of the street, you know, hustling, selling from my hawking stand. A gentleman saw me say, hey, listen, I love your energy. Do you want to come through tomorrow to Mass Mart, which is the extension of uh, Walmart in Africa? Do you want to come through to Walmart for an interview for a sales job. I said, yeah, definitely. And the following day, I rock up there and uh, luckily to myself, I got the job. But what was the job? I was then tasked to sell vacuum cleaners. But here's the thing, I have lived till then, I think about 20 years old in my entire life. I had never seen a vacuum cleaner, ladies and gentlemen. I had never seen a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> so I was given a sales script and uh, I came back the following day, and the following day, as I came from that very day, I worked for two years, 365 times two, nonstop, right? Selling, selling, and making money. And from that, grace to God, I was then promoted, right? Because I was in a small town, but the money I was making was competing with the cities and the capital. From there, I was promoted from being a sales consultant, I became a star manager. In a few months, I became an area manager. From there, I became a regional manager. And in less than three years, ladies and gentlemen, of joining this company, I was in senior management, right? And we talking that I was very, very young. I was the age of, I think, 23, 23, 24. I mean, they had people at the age of 50 that were working, you know, under me. And my team was huge. I was, I was handling over two to 300 people. Now, the reason why I'm telling these stories to you, ladies and gentlemen, is not to impress you at all, no, but to actually bring to your attention that I have worked in that company in the position of leadership for a while, right? And when you work with people in the position of leadership of which the role of a leader, I believe, is not only to lead people towards a destination or towards the accomplishment of a certain goal, but the role of a leader actually is to help those people discover their own sense of leadership. Because when they are able to step up and become leaders themselves, your mission is accomplished. And that I will firmly believe, although GCI has its creed, although the organization that I'm speaking to today has its creed, you know, has its mission statement and so forth, but I will stand firmly believe that that's what GCI is about. It's about being able to make each and everyone that join discover their own sense of leadership. And that brings me to the Renaissance leader, which is actually the topic of the talk today. You see, what is a Renaissance leader? A Renaissance leader is the person that possesses a profound, right, a profound knowledge in, you know, in a profound, should I say, diverse knowledge, you know, across various topics of life and decide, now this is the most important part, and decide to actually use that knowledge to do what? To serve purpose, to serve people, to create innovative, I mean, innovative, inno, sorry, innovative solutions for problems and to bring people together, right? Now, remember that at the beginning of this talk, I was telling you about what that a leader needs to be able to do what? A self-evaluation consistently. And when a leader is able to do a self-evaluation, he knows the things that he knows and the things that he needs to learn. And through that, he's able to gain much more knowledge. And by getting that knowledge, it's not only for his own benefit, but what is to fulfill the purpose that is at hand, is to be able to serve these people. It is to be able to create innovative solutions consistently. It is, it is for him to be able to bring the people together. So ladies and gentlemen, 
This is what I want to share with you. You see, when we say in that bringing people together, the truth is that bringing people together is not easy at all. That's why, you know, I salute the JCI Jamaican president that I believe is on this call right now. I salute you, you know, because I believe that you must be doing a great job. Although I have not followed your parkour, but I know something that bringing people together and following on a vision is definitely not possible. Yeah, and you, yeah, and you cannot do it alone if you don't have your team with you. So salute to the team as well, as well as the entire of JCI Jamaica. I think you guys are awesome, right? So ladies and gentlemen, before I move on, I just want to make sure that we are on the same page. So give me a year if you are on the same page as I am. Yeah. 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 Awesome, 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 awesome. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So. As I was talking about the, you know, the diversity in, in the group of people, I want to introduce you to a concept that, is, that was introduced to me by the word taught, I mean, word number four, taught via actual commas. And this concept is called a color brain concept. So color brain basically is a science which studies how people gain clarity, right? So color brain, then you have people with green brain, people with red brain, blue brain and purple brain, right? A green brain, which I am, a green brain, right, is what we call a chaotic processor. So the person with the green brain is the guy that he only works with the vision, just showing the vision and he's got to take action because he only gets clarity through action taken. And then you have the purple brain, right? The purple brain is process driven. So a person with a purple brain will never take action if they do not know how exactly is the process going to happen from A to Z, right? So uh, they have, you know, huge aversion for it. So definitely they've got to make sure that if they know every single step of the process before they even take a step, you know, towards the accomplishment of the goal. And then blue brains, then blue brains are people with intuition, right? They only work in intuition. So when, when you meet people, brain, I mean, people with blue brains, what they say is, you know, the words they use the most is I feel, right? They, will be instant, they don't see, use words like I think, no. They will say, I feel this, you know, I feel that. I feel you shouldn't do this, I feel. So blue brain people work with their intuition. And then what about the red brain people? Red brain people actually a bit of mixture between the green brain and the purple brain. So the red brain people actually, um, they work with the bigger picture, but they also need to know the process yeah, and there. So they manage to balance both, right? Now, the challenge comes in when you are in a group where you have to actually get those people together, or at least you have to co-create together. So the reason why I'm sharing this with you, ladies and gentlemen, is that I am totally aware that in the group, whether you like it or not, there's always going to be times of conflict, right? There's always going to be times of disagreement. But it is my firm belief that the disagreement do not come, you know, solely because people want to, but the disagreements come because we do not understand the language that we are speaking to one another. And that language comes from the process through which we gain clarity, comes from the process through which we understand the information. Now, I may be sharing this with you right now, but the truth is, Everybody on this call is not processing this information the very same way, right? Is not understanding this information the very same way. Some are taking much more out of it. Some are taking totally different route out of this information that I'm sharing. And that is what happens all the time. But if we are able to identify that, you know what? My colleague right here is actually a blue brain. She works with intuition. My colleague right here is a green brain. You know, all he needs is the vision. And then he gets clarity through action taken. If we are able to understand what is the process of clarity gain of one another, we are able to get together and work together. Right. So being a Renaissance leader, you know, is also being able to understand how the other party, how our fellows also function, how our fellows gain clarity. Right. So ladies and gentlemen, here's what I'm saying, right, that my firm belief is that nowadays with whatever that is going on in the world, it is not enough 
to just being leaders anymore, right? It is not enough to just be leaders that will be able just to influence others, right, through inspiration. I'm saying that it's just not enough. It's just not enough, ladies and gentlemen, for us to want to live for ourselves, for us to only talk about leadership, but actually not to live it, right? What I do believe that is necessary, though, is for us to be able to be and live and step into our Renaissance leadership, right? And again, if you want me to define, I will repeat this definition again, that a Renaissance leader is the person that possess a profound knowledge in, I mean, in various across many, 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 many kind of, you know, uh, domains, but decide to channel those abilities, right? For the purpose, for the greater good, right? For what, for, in, in order for them to solve, you know, creatively problems, right? Make the right decisions and definitely bring people together. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I am almost right getting towards the end of my talk. Right. But this is the question that I want to ask you. Right. Since I mean, we are we are in a in a in a in a Facebook group call, I am I am I mean in a Zoom group call. This is the question that I want to ask you. Right. Now, do you guys think? that you have what it takes to be a Renaissance leader. I think I will start from the president today. President, do you think that you have what it takes to be a Renaissance leader? Yes, sir. <laughs> How about Roda? Roda, 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 my dad had fun. Thank you, Roda, for making this possible. Roda, I am sure that you have what it takes, but I want to hear it from you yourself. Is Roda there? Roda Andrea, is she there? Well, it's all right, ladies and gentlemen. Let us move to the next person. Who else believes that they have what it takes to go out there, self-evaluate, right? I mean, have a self-evaluation, have a learner's attitude, and gain that knowledge to serve the greater good, to serve a cause that is beyond themselves, right? To create innovative solutions for problems we have nowadays and definitely bring people together. Who else on this call today? Who else in this group do they believe they have what it takes to be a renaissance leader i do oh yeah yeah we have somebody somebody is there that she does who else is that i do i think awesome all right Ladies and gentlemen, I love the fact that, you know, there is enthusiasm that's coming from the group, you know, that there are people that are definitely believing in themselves that they can be those Renaissance leaders. Well, lovely people, I want to share this one story, this one last story with you. You see, in exactly 11 days from now, I'm going to be celebrating my birthday. And uh, contrary to, you know, popular belief, when I celebrate my birthday, actually, it's not a day that I actually go and party or a day that I actually want to spend with people. But it is a day that I actually spend alone because I believe that that is the day that my year is actually started. My year didn't start on the 1st of January 2020 or or any other first scenario for that matter. But my year stuck exactly on the day of my birthday. And it's the day that I, I, it's the day that I spend with myself to actually think, right? Do an account, you know, look back into the year that I've lived. What are the things that I've done? You know, what are the goals that I've achieved? What are the ones that I've missed? What are the great things that I do? And what are the better things that I could have done? So, you know, I take account, you know, throughout all that day, right? Exactly, you know, and through that, I'm able to put an action plan together for my year that we follow. And one birthday, you know, that was about six, six, six years ago. One birthday, and I remember that birthday, you know, I was, I was again far from home. And uh, that birthday, I was all alone, again, thinking, and, and my mom called me, right? And my mom called me. 
and she wished me happy birthday and she gave me you know some wise words that I would like, I would like to share with you right now these are these are the things that she said so she said that you might have made mistakes right in your previous year right? you might have had some victories or some failures but again they do not determine where you will be they do not determine how far you are yet to reach they do not determine what you are truly made of so do not hold on to the regrets and the mistakes that you know you have done while you are going through this thinking process but instead rejoice for they have taught you something and with those lessons that you've gained be able to then create a new path for yourself now, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I'm telling this is that I am pretty much sure that one of the purpose of you know, the national convention this year is for you to be able to look back on what has been accomplished right throughout this year and therefore also put together an action plan that is going to happen for this year, Jamaica, in the coming year. So I will share with you the very wise words that my mom shared with me is that whatever has happened in this year, Right. Let us learn from it. Let us take those and make them our strength so that the days that are ahead of us, the year that is to come, we indeed step up and become, truly become, truly live our true nature, which is being those one, I mean, which is being the Renaissance leaders that we are indeed supposed to be, that we are indeed born to be. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stephen Dosu. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you. Remember, you can be great. See you on top. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Andrea is ready to talk now, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much. That was powerful. All of, where are you now? You're in Indonesia? Yeah, currently I'm in Bali currently. Uh, so thanks for joining. In, in Netherlands. Yes, thanks for joining all, all, from, all the way in Bali, Indonesia. What time is it there now? Uh, it's 1 a.m. right now. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> So thank you, Stephen, for yeah. sharing your life story with us. That is a powerful um, story. Any of us who know the history of Togo and all of those countries in that side of the world will know how difficult it is. And for you who have made it all the way from there to South Africa, now to Indonesia, and to be talking to us all the way in, in Jamaica, yeah. in Zoom, and you're on Facebook Live to the point where... Um, or JCI brother Bart from JCI Belgium has joined the, the Zoom room and he was watching on Facebook. So well done, Stephen, and thanks so much for joining us. I do not know if anybody has in the want to say anything to you. Thank you, Stephen. Commendation to you. Glad to know you and glad that you are here with us today. We appreciate you and we say thanks again. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rada. I appreciate you too. Uh, Stephen, I must say it was a very inspirational uh, presentation. Uh, you were able to share your life experiences and how it helped to mold you as a leader and how you can have, you have used those experiences to train other persons to be effective leaders and as I said, to be the Renaissance leader. So it's an awesome presentation and thank you again for taking the time out from presenting us all the way from Bali, which is somewhere I, it's on my bucket list to visit. So um, enjoy the sun and the fun when the sunlight comes up, you know, and it's 1 a.m. there now. So have a good um, morning when you decide to go to bed and commendations again on a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Franchette, Franchette Stephen, she's from Mauritius and she says hello. She's watching on Facebook. You know that Franchette is the national president for JCI Mauritius. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. And we look forward to working with you again. And we hope to see you face to face, probably in South Africa for World Congress or somewhere about there. Okay, great. That'll be awesome. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you. 
Did you say you say you are from JC Mauritius? No, I'm saying that um Franchette. Okay. Okay. Franchette from JC Mauritius. She and I we were in Japan. She's watching via Facebook Live. So she says greetings. Oh, all right, all right. Okay, yeah, I send my greetings too. Frances, connect with me. Let's 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 get in touch. I, I might I might want to speak at I mean JC Mauritius too. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> so Franchet, please do that. All right. And Senator Hartley saying, and he's from Barbados. So you have been all over the Caribbean today. Senator Hartley's from Barbados, and he's saying a wonderful presentation. All right. Great. I'm, I'm, I'm just one, you know, one button away. Just go on Facebook, Stephen Dosso, Instagram, Stephen Dosso, www.stephendosso.com. Get in touch with me. You know, I love, love expanding my network. All right, she says she will contact you. <laughs> Great. Good. Thank you, guys. And we're going to end the Zoom, sorry, the Facebook Live at this time as we're going to go into in-house matters and all of those things. So, and we don't want to bore Facebook with all of this. So thank you very much, Facebook, for watching. Thanks, um, Stephen, for this wonderful presentation. And thanks, Deidre. And we encourage you to stay. Stephen, I know you have to go to bed, but if you have the energy, you can continue to stay with us. So goodbye, Facebook. And if you want to join from JCI World, if you want to join our um, Zoom room, the passcode is there. All right. Thank you very much. Great. Right.